todo. Perfecto. Bueno, pues muchas, muchísimas gracias a todas por acompañarnos hoy. Nos emociona mucho que estén participando en el primer webinar de, de esta serie de webinars que queremos armar y, y ese es un tema súper relevante para nosotras y como lo hemos llamado Participation on Board. Eh, hoy estamos invitando a Joana Posada para que nos cuente su experiencia. Joana es el fundador y managing partner de Elevar Equity. Posiblemente muchas de ustedes conocen, pero para dar una, una breve intro, y aquí Gaby me va a ayudar a poner de background, no lo voy a leer, pero creo que voy a resaltar lo más relevante. Elevar Equity es una firma de inversión que tiene como objetivo apoyar emprendedores que están llevando acceso a productos o servicios esenciales y han logrado apoyar emprendedores que hasta la fecha han apoyado a más de 30 millones de low income households en India y en América Latina. Entonces, para que se den una idea de qué hace Elevar Equity para, que, para los que no lo conocen. Eh, y para nosotros es un honor tener a Joana aquí hoy con nosotros. Eh, antes de pasarle la palabra a Joana, creo que quería contarles, no sé si tuvieron oportunidad de leer el blog post que escribí, en el cual traté de ser muy transparente y abierta de los propios struggles o, o preguntas que yo me he hecho a lo largo de, pues de la oportunidad que he tenido de sentarme en ciertos boards, ¿no? Entonces, eh, creo que como muchas de ustedes que posiblemente también se habrán enfrentado a esto porque están participando en este board, creo que hemos tenido struggles personales en cómo balancear el, el fiduciary duty que tenemos con nuestros LPs, que es por alguna razón es la que estamos ahí sentados en ese board, con el cómo en realidad agregar valor a estos emprendedores, ¿no? Entonces, aparte de este, de este blog que escribí para contar un poquito de mi experiencia y para quienes estén pasando por una situación similar que no se sientan solos, también quisimos abordar, eh, previo a la conversación con Joana, eh, la experiencia de los emprendedores. Hicimos una, una encuesta muy rápida a un grupo de emprendedores y les preguntamos de forma muy directa, ¿qué esperan ustedes de la persona que está en el board? Y dijeron cosas como, esperamos que nos ayude con networking, esperamos que nos ayude con estrategia de negocios, esperamos que nos apoyen en procesos de reclutamiento, en procesos de desarrollo de negocios nuevamente, eh, que nos ayuden a detectar estos weak spots dentro de las compañías, que nos ayuden a establecer un gobierno corporativo formal y por último que sea de alguna manera un advisor directo, incondicional y que, y que hable de una forma muy transparente con el CEO. Y esto, como podrán ver, pues requiere experiencia, requiere haber pasado por, por varias situaciones y muchas veces, como me pasó a mí, la primera vez que tuve una posición en el board, pues era muy joven, tal vez no había tenido una experiencia previa, entonces se va construyendo sobre esto, ¿no? Pero la buena noticia es que hoy tenemos a, a Joana, que Joana ha tenido una experiencia muy importante como inversionista y también como, eh, como miembro de board, ha agregado muchísimo valor, entonces para nosotros es un honor enorme tenerla aquí hoy con nosotros en este grupo tan acotado compartiendo sus experiencias, así que esperamos que le saquen muchísimo provecho y bueno, sin más preámbulo, le doy la bienvenida a Joana, muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. No, mil gracias Paula y otra vez, de, mil gracias Susana y todo, todas las organizadoras de WeInvest para tenerme aquí. La verdad que es, es, es este, un, or, un honor estar y cuando veo a gente como Gaby y Susana, que también tienen muchísima experiencia, eh, me siento muy afortunada y la verdad es que espero que también puedan, puedan contribuir porque sé que hay mucha, mucha experiencia también en este grupo de mujeres. Eh, se me acercaron a decir que hable de los boards y no, la verdad que no quise hacer una presentación porque... Good Governance, creo que uno puede meterse al McKinsey o al Harvard Business Review y obviamente eh, leer de eso de manera mejor. Entonces, la verdad es que pensé hablar un poco de mi experiencia más de una parte per, eh, personal, ¿no? Eh, y, y un poco hablar de cuáles han sido mis aprendizajes con el gran caveat que obviamente sigo aprendiendo. O sea, creo que sí, como dice Paula, es algo, es, es un proceso y cada board en los que he estado es diferente, entonces a veces cambian las dinámicas, entonces realmente estás aprendiendo en cada, en cada consejo en el que estás. Eh, pero bueno, un poco la agenda, y voy a tratar de, de, de dejar suficiente tiempo para que realmente esto se vuelva una conversación, más de, de, de preguntas y, y respuestas. Eh, iba a dar un poquito de, de mi contexto, ¿no? 
y después hablar un poco acerca de algunos temas relevantes, ¿no? Un poco eh, acerca de cuáles son los objetivos de, del consejo, composición, roles, eh, diversidad, que creo que a este grupo le importa mucho, y cerrar un poco con los do's and don'ts, que, que creo que es, son muy importantes. Me voy a cambiar inglés porque no sé si esto otra vez lo va a ver alguien eh, de Brasil o lo que sea, y, y creo que, que, que es un poco más universal. Eh, entonces, eh, me cambio a inglés, pero obviamente si tienen alguna pregunta o cualquier cosa, podemos hacerlo en ambos, ambos lenguajes. Um, so, just as context, so uh, my first board was about, I would say, 13 to 14 years ago. I was in my early 20s. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so early 30s. Um, it, it was a very traditional board. It was actually a Mexican SOFOM, a non-bank finance company. Uh, and it was backed by the typical, you know, Mexican families. So very, very traditional, wealthy Mexican families. So my other board members were actually very successful Mexican finance professionals. You know, a guy who had been uh, in, in, in president of the board of, of the Mexican SEC uh, and another, you know, very um, successful entrepreneurs, but they were all in their early 70s. So imagine, uh, needless to say, I still remember uh, that in a way they embraced me very paternalistically, right? And they had very inappropriate jokes. But, I mean, that's definitely <laughs> my, my remember, but it was, it was really intimidating at first. Um, I would say, you know, when you join a board, you may not know the people and it becomes even more difficult if you don't necessarily understand the industry or, or the company. So, um, you know, for me it was very present that I did not have the professional experience, right? Or the, you know, colmillo, which is kind of the gut feeling that you have that only comes with years and experience. So in a way, I had to find like a comfort zone, right? A base from which I could speak up and ensure that I could participate and influence the conversation and hopefully add, add value. Um, and so the good thing is I've, I've never been shy. The bad thing maybe is I've never been shy, but, but a good way to start for me, a starting point was actually asking questions. I think actually like even the most simple questions at the risk of embarrassing yourself are important because I've noticed that sometimes you can have like a very basic question and that really opens a very interesting uh, conversation. So that was one. It was like, you know, I'm learning, so I'm just going to ask questions. And the second one was I did have a comfort around the industry. So this was microfinance. I had been in the industry for a couple of years. I had visited about eight to 10 countries um, and seen you know, microfinance across different models in those countries. So that for me was, was my, like the zone where I was you know, bringing a different lens, like a unique lens, learnings from other, other, other countries, uh, comparisons. And so I think from that perspective, that's where I, I felt I was being heard and, and could bring value. Um, since then, I've been in about 12 boards, including one nonprofit board, um, which is Social Enterprise Nest. Um, I've been in a handful of observers, um, as an observer on boards and also on advisory boards. But, you know, needless to say, it's cut across uh, companies that have done very well and others that, that haven't. And as I said, you know, depending on the board, whether you're an observer, fool, or whatever it is, um, dynamics really do change um, from board to board. So be, before I jump in into this next section, I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, how many of you have been in boards, like how much experience we have amongst this group. And I just see, I'm not seeing all of them, but I would say about half of us at least have some, some experience. Um, okay, great. So when you think about the role of the board, can someone just share generally, you know, what do you think the role is? I'm going to call call if not. I know some of you. <laughs> Christine, you've been called called. <laughs> Happy to call call. Like it's mostly <laughs> I love being on board with you and see you work. Um, but um, I think of two things, the role of the board. One is, yes, the corporate governance, right? So there is that role of just making sure that the right 
um, reporting is done and that the company is on track and you sort of meet the responsibility you have fulfilling that role as a board member. But I like of your points that you that you shared, the most important one being, I think as a board member is your role to the advisor, to the CEO and to the senior management team. Yeah, yeah. Susanna, any thoughts? Sorry, did you say Susanna? Yeah. Oh, okay. Of course. Um, no, you got broken. I think um, one very important role for board members is um, a strategic thinking. You want to accompany the company in its growth, whether it is a startup or a more developed, and therefore you, you really have to understand the moment of the company in order to know what are the key um, elements for success at that given stage. Exactly. So, so what I'm hearing is, you know, corporate management, of course, right? You have a fiduciary responsibility. There's an oversight function. Uh, you're representing the interest of shareholders and, you know, all the relevant stakeholders, not only share, say, um, you know, the shareholders. Um, but I think in the strategy thing, you're collectively directing the company's strategy and affairs. And as, as, as Kristen said, you, you, you know, there's all this, you know, kind of you, you become a sounding board, right, for the CEO. But in all of this, what I would say, the description I've read, which I, I, I would highlight because I think it's, it's very important to, to think about it as, as, well, as well, is that um, you have to think about the board as a very strong, high-functioning work group whose members trust and challenge each other and engage directly with senior management on critical issues. Because I think at the end of the day, it does come back to people, right? So you, when you think about the board, you can think about size and structure and, and you know all the types of compliance that need to go around it. But at the end of the day, it is about people and human interactions. And so for those that you know have taken an MBA, you can learn about it in your corporate finance you know, courses, but I think a lot of the learnings are really gonna come from more of your interpersonal dynamics, right? Which is a touchy feeling part of, part of things because for me, effective boards have really been about how the group performs as, you know, really, you know, is there an open conversation? Do you have a relationship with other board members? What is the relationship between the CEO and other board members uh, and, and the board as a whole? So for me, that's, th those are, are things I think I'm going to highlight a lot as, as, as we, we have this, this discussion. Um, with respect to constitution of the board. So I'm going to talk more about formal boards, but I'm sure that many of you also have the opportunity to join advisory boards. The big difference there is, of course, legally defined responsibilities, right? Um, Board, actual board members are elected by the uh, shareholders. Uh, they're governed by the, the, the corporation's bylaws. And um, on the other side, an advisory role is really informal, right? It's, it's usually put together by the CEO. It's a group of experts and advisors that are handpicked to, to you know, kind of fill in gaps in, in expertise, et cetera. Um, and so, I mean, it definitely, being a full board member does have, of course, if you're an investor, you know, you think about monitoring your, your investment, having influence, and also, you know, kind of the legal rights that, that come uh, with being a board member. Um, having said this, you know, with all those rights, there's a lot of responsibility and there is personal liability. So my advice here, just for anyone that's thinking about joining a board is you know, everyone's jumping on the bits like, I wanna be part of the board. Frankly, sometimes I prefer to be an observer, but if you are gonna join, you need to understand because it does change by country by country. You need to understand well, um, what are the implications of being a board member? And you can actually structure around it if, if need be. I mean, for example, I don't know how many of you have been in a board in Spain, uh, but being a board member, like an individual, person that's a board member in Spain, there is personal liability if some decisions are not taken at a certain point, right? And, and that, I mean, they can come um, after your assets. So usually it's better to like name the corporation and then 
you know, be a representative of that corporation. So the only thing I'm not going to go into a lot of fiduciary um, discussions around fiduciary duty, but I just wanted to uh, put it out there so that anyone that's thinking of joining a, a board really understands that, makes sure that, you know, um, again, you have the organization, everyone's like minutes, you're understanding what you're signing, and more than anything that there's, there's also DNO insurance. So that's, that's just kind of a a thing I wanted to, to talk about there. Now, with respect, and, and, and Susanna just mentioned this, and I think it's important, is the board roles, board compositions, et cetera, is really gonna change um, based on where the company's at, right? Whether it's a startup and in what part of the evolution it, it, it's at. So all of that, <clears throat> as you, Think about the evolution of the boards. Those those are the things that that need to you know be kept uh, at the top of the, your mind. <clears throat> what's um, what's often said about startups is that a lot of people think that boards shouldn't set, be set up until you've raised the first round of funding. Um, yes, in some countries there's a legal requirement that private companies have at least one director, so people kind of just name the CEO, right? But that's not really the value added uh, real board that we're talking about. So in my, you know, we as Alivar, and, and I definitely, you know, my experience is that for our companies, we've always pushed them to form boards early on. I mean, even, even, even on, on, on a pre-seed uh, basis, uh, they don't need to be complicated, but the benefits of forming a true value at board early on in the life cycle of a startup, uh, irrespective of, of where it is and raising funds are, are very obvious. Um, in my experience, a lot of the reasons for startup failures uh, are internal, not necessarily external. So overconfidence of the team, especially if it's a young team, disagreement between the founding teams, and sometimes you have co-CEOs, uh, lack of expertise, and all of those issues can be avoided or at least mitigated, right? If you have a strong supportive board. Um, and, and I also think that if you form a good board early on, it actually, you know, as, as the company raises and it's gonna raise from institutional investors, it, it is something that's well received and, and actually helps up, helps on the fundraising uh, of the company. Um, here, I'll just do a parenthesis because I know a lot of us are investing in Latin America. So there's this new trend with safes, right? So everyone's kind of raising safes right now. Everyone loves them. Uh, entrepreneurs want to raise money with them. And I definitely can see why, why, why they would want to do that. One of my issues with safe is that I consider it an equity instrument, right? And so I, I put my money in, it's going to convert, um, it's going to be, you know, a months or a year until they do their 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 you know series a uh, but even then uh, i think that a board should be constituted there even if it's you know there's informality around it but at least put something in place because my sense is that entrepreneurs are saying well we don't need a board right now um and so kind of the you know just building the expectation uh and and and, and you know, keeping it simple, but then, you know, just making them realize that there, there is value to a board. And so you, you've got to be involved. You need to be adding value. It, 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 you know, you have to, you know, my sense is there, I, I, you really want to push them to, to set up a board. And as you set up a board, our experience is that you start with, with a small board, um, usually a typical startup board will be comprised of say three members that usually is a founder. If there's two co-investors, maybe the two VCs. Uh, and if you're lucky, actually you bring in an independent. And I'll talk about the role of ind independent and how independents have helped me and why I think they're so important. But, um, but it may not happen, right? Sometimes the dynamics are such and, and if, frankly, you can start small. You can start with three and that's usually what you will see. Uh, in my experience, five member boards actually work really well. Um, and then, you know, as the company matures, you, you know, dynamics change and you start adding, you know, more board members. Um, I would say I've been in boards of seven people and still works. 
it's not always true that smaller boards function better than big ones, but but you do want to kind of, you know, it, it just it becomes more difficult, right? Like scheduling becomes more difficult, the conversations, the format, it just becomes more difficult. But, you know, it is something that as the company matures, you're going to see the dynamics change, right? Um, even in smaller and larger boards, the one comment I would have here is that a lot of the decisions are actually taken outside of the formal board meeting. So there's a lot of one-to-one -one or one-to-two -two conversation in happening outside, right? Before you reach the board as a whole. So a good CEO that manages the board well is also talking and has that cadence and that trust to be ensure that the conversation and the information is happening outside the board so that when we come together, there's alignment. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be a good discussion. And sometimes, you know, again, one cannot agree. But in general, I would say it's very hard to think about decision making on a two hour meeting, you know, every three months. So there's a lot of dynamics outside the board that one needs to consider, right? Um, one example, which is kind of crazy, is we actually just closed a term sheet for an investment of close to like half a billion dollars. And it was, I mean, it was all side conversations and then one vote. So it just, I mean, it also depends on the boards, but, but it's just, um, again, a lot of happens outside. Um, and then, the other thing that we need to be conscious as companies mature is that if you're an early investor, you know, you may have been in the board, but then as new investors come in and the dynamics change, you may need, need to step aside. Um, you know, that was my experience with Cre Justo as well, right? Um, um, you know, I started very early with them. And once it's raised a lot of money, you know, at some point I stepped down. So they're my my I guess the thing the, the three things I, I want you to think about that is um, again you're representing a shareholder if if part of your investment thesis is that you're going to be active and you want a board seat you're negotiating that from the beginning and you should think about that right as the cap table evolves right so if you still want to retain your board seat think about like what's going to be the cap table evolution and what rights you're negotiating from the beginning so you can perhaps keep the board or at least keep an observer board board and i think observer boards are actually very very interesting so think about you know the rights as you're doing the investment and how that's going to evolve and and what's going to be kind of the role and what what rights you're going to have during that that evolution and the other thing i would say there is even if you're not a board member, you still can have a lot of influence. How do you still have a lot of influence? One is because you've built relationship with other board members. You've built a relationship with the CEO. So, so frankly, you're you're again. Hello. You're getting you're getting Hi. that that Hi. exposure right Happy through Friday. that. Hi. Sorry. What's going no. on? Um, and. Um, and you can also, by the way, so what we did is you can negotiate getting some of the board materials. So that's an interesting thing, which is even if you're stepping down, having just access to what's being, you know, kind of looked at at the board is, of course, with all the confidentiality that, that needs to be there. But, but it's also something that you should think about. But, but the influence really comes through relationships. So, you know, especially if there's an independent board member, what I would say there is they really, it, it's always, you know, having influence on who that independent is and he truly has to be an independent, but then he really becomes an amazing advocate, right? For the company and even shareholders that are not represented on the board and having a relationship with kind of that independent is important. And that's, you know, how we best managed on companies where, where we don't have board seats. Um, I'll um, just go quickly into uh, some of the member roles that I've discussed. So, you know, why the independent? Um, for me, independence and, and a lot of 
a lot of the boards don't have, I mean, it's, it's hard because it's another board seat. So a lot of people are very careful, right? They like founders would, would actually say, well, I prefer it to be my CFO. I prefer it to be my co-founder, right? And so it, it's hard, like having a board seat where you can add an independent, it's not an easy conversation. And then there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of discussion of, you know, what type of independent do you want, what knowledge and expertise or areas, right, um, he can bring. And, and, you know, again, independence in that sense, you can have, you know, very knowledgeable um, and, and bring, you know, complement the CEO, but also complement other board members. Um, having said that, I've been and seen boards where the independent is this very well-known person that never engages. So if you if you're thinking about independent, make sure even if he's not like the you know uh, Warren Buffett, right? Um, you know, make sure that it is someone that can be engaged with the company, um, and, and and it's going to be there and it's going to attend board meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, 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 but the other role of independent is really kind of a balancing function, uh, because they're looking, um, for what is good for the company and its shareholders, employee, customers, right, needs to have an attitude of independent and needs to be empowered by the board and the shareholders to put that independence to work. So, you know, when you're representing a shareholder, there are going to be certain discussions that are that become difficult with the management team, right? Um, a perfect example for that is ESOP, right? And I've and I've been in situations where on the follow-on rounds, there's all the discussions around kind of employee stock options, you know. And and at the beginning, what I tell my entrepreneurs is, as you come into a company, it's so much easier to set the right stock option plan with with you know make it make it hefty because as you're fundraising right and evolving it's going to be more difficult to to add more 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 stock options so you know there's been conversations uh, with the team that become a little difficult with other you know board members even you know or, or me as a shareholder and I've, I've, I've seen that the independents can manage those, those discussions if they're a good independent really well, right? Because they can actually uh, translate some of, some of the conversation. So I would really encourage that um, you think about independents in, in, in your boards. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, if you have the ability of being an observer, I think it's wonderful. Um, I've been in boards where there's other observers. They really add value. I think that observers should speak up. Um, in some of my boards, observers are the most active participants. Of course, you need to be respected to other the, the other full board members. But if a company is choosing to have observers, they can certainly bring, bring value. Um, the only thing you've got to balance is not having too many, right? I mean, having like five board members and five observers, then it becomes a little bit crazy. But, but you know, again, my point of view is have a handful of observers that can break value. And I think observers um, do have all the information and, and, and do speak up. Um, and finally, just an unconstitution and kind of roles. I'll talk about board committees you will usually see those more as the company matures, right? And I think that that they're important. At the beginning, I would say it becomes a little bit ludicrous because if you have, say, three members, right, or even up to five members, two of them are, 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 um, are, are the shareholders uh, or represent the shareholders, you know, you're going to have the comp committee uh, and it's it's going to be the whole board. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, just, just think about, you know, how many, you don't want to complicate the board too much at the beginning, but I think having a comp committee or at least all, all the members being part of compensation early on is super important. Uh, why? Because again, the allocation and the structuring of employee stock option is very, very important and relevant, especially in the early um, um, stages of a company. Um, and then the other good committee to have 
uh, which is kind of a safeguard for good governance, is the audit, right? Um, the audit commission uh, committee, and I, I don't know why I always end up in audit committees, but um, it actually, um, if you like the nitty gritty of financials, right, and you really want to go deep into the numbers, and and again, you know, part of you know being a, a lot of us, especially in boards, you know, really like to look at the reporting and the numbers and everything. Um, the audit committee, in that sense, is great; gives you a lot of visibility. And again, it's just something where even for startups, we're asking them to be audited. Um, so, so it, so it is, it is. It, I would say the comp committee and the audit committee are the two committees where, that I would recommend in the early stage stages of a company. Uh, and finally, I would encourage ex executive sessions. I think, except like right after a board having an executive session, um, sometimes they don't need to be. I mean, you know, it's kind of just highlighting some things that they don't need to be long, but but executive sessions, I, I would say, is something that I would also recommend that that you establish at the board uh, level. Um, I'm almost done. So diversity, we all know it. Uh, it matters when you look around, you know, it across the world, 50% are female. When you look at the workforce, in many cases, that's the case as well. So uh, women make the majority of buying decisions. Um, and in a board group, you want to bring that that perspective, right? And how to handle situations, especially if it's situations with employees. So I felt, again, when you look at Elevar, do we have a lot of board representation? Yes, you know, me and my partner and a lot of our team are women. So, so we kind of, you know, move that needle towards having women, but women see things differently, right? Um, we need to, we tend to be more intuitive um, in, in, in reading a situation and body language. Um, and, and also we need, we actually are more focused on human capital and recognizing what it takes to work with people to get things done. So in my experience, again, you've got to kind of find your superpower and 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 part of you know being a woman board member, it it, it is that. It is it is that I think the CEO also feels that you're listening. Um so we I've been in kind of tough, tough conversations. Um, and we've have had to have very tough conversations with the CEO, but at the end of those calls, I always call them and see how they're doing personally, right? And just checking on them. And, and I think for them, even if the, you know, the concept, they may not like it or, or, you know, they will accept it where they really appreciate a, a board member is that again, it's not that we're unconditional because I don't think that we, we can be unconditional with CEOs, but that we listen. And I think that's something that as a woman we bring and, and we should embrace it more. And also as women, we can have more influence on composition of the management teams. So uh, really kind of pushing the company to have more di diversity in their teams. And sometimes for recruiting, that also helps a lot. Like, you know, we wanted to hire a CFO in Tienda Nube. She wasn't that sure. You know, you talk to her, she knows that there's women board members, that, you know, there's a champion there for diversity, et cetera. And so you actually, it's, it's good for recruiting. And at the end of the day, I think that investors nowadays want to see diversity both in boards and at the level of the company. So it's not only, you know, what should be, but it's it's good business, right? Um, finally, so we can leave some time for for discussion. I'll talk about some do's and some don'ts. Um, well, do create a virtuous cycle of respect, uh, trust, and candor. Again, trust. I highlighted at the beginning. I'll highlight it here again. Take time to develop uh, relationships with other board members. Um, if you have a crisis, you need you need to trust people, right? So uh, we need to consider um, it's not only how we structure a board, but the social system that the board actually is. Um, so build those relationships, not only in the meetings, but outside the meetings. Um, do debate strategic decisions openly and constructively. It doesn't always mean that it's easy discussions. There can be very uncomfortable discussions, but you know, honestly, 
uh, they have to take take place. And at the end of the day, even if you don't have complete agreement, you know, the discussion should should flow. And if not, you know, one needs to kind of reconsider whether it's there's a good board dynamic or not. Um, do insist and ensure that the team provides sufficient information on time, agendas, information. This is a struggle. I'm sure every one of you suffer because you're getting the PowerPoint, the board PowerPoint, a few hours before the board, right? And so it, it's super frustrating because I do think that you do have to come prepared. And part of it is reading all the material and you have time, you should have time to read the material. I've been in boards where there's so much because they're kind of regulated entity and there's just so much compliance and, and things that I think it's impossible to kind of read, read everything. And so, you know, it, it, it's sometimes very frustrating, but, you know, good boards that have concise information that can send you the PowerPoint in time, you're just going to be more effective and the boards are going to be more effective. So with your with your entrepreneurs and everything, do, do insist that they send information uh, on time and do ask questions. As dumb as they, as they, they, they can, they can seem sometimes a very, very um, basic and, and what seems to be, you know, I always start sometimes a conversation saying, this may be a dumb question, but, right? Um, ask them in any case, um, so, so that, because I think it, it may start a good debate and, 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 and you should clarify those things. So um, in terms of don'ts, and this is in particular knowing, knowing a lot of, um, you know, some tendencies that we have as women. Do not lose the forest for the trees. So I've been with other board members and some in some boards and what I've seen sometimes, and I think I did this at the beginning as well, is I was so focused on whether the comma was there or the number was there, or you're so, you know, in, in the details that you're not taking a step and really thinking about the strategic discussion. So always, again, whatever our tendency is, try to make sure that uh, you don't lose the, the strategic discussion, right? Um, in that sense, do not micromanage, right? Um, that's the other thing I also uh, observed on, on some boards where I saw other women, uh, that they were actually kind of almost micromanaging or, or getting into, into operations, and that's, that's not the role of the board. Um, do not carry a diversity kind of stick or chip in your fold and in, in, in your shoulder. Again, as women, we tend to be, we like per perfection. So if we feel that our comment is not perfect, or, you know, you feel that you're just intimidating, right? So you're not going to speak up. Um, and so you, you just have to work on that to, to really get, get over that. Um, do not create political fractions. The worst boards I've been in, and frankly, the worst investments I've been in, is when there's just bad co-investors, right? Or bad CEOs that take information and kind of give this person information or this one and, and just put, you know, try to create misinformation. And I think that's, it, it's so counterproductive. It, at the end of the day, people talk each other. So it's been it's been crazy because I've been in boards where you know, in situations with other shareholders, where of course we're going to talk, right? So so I think at the end of the day, um, people just need to be transparent and and have that conversation up front. Um, do not create committees that are too large to be effective. That's another one. And do not forget your fiduciary duty. And again, remember that there's always personal um, liability on the board. But I'll stop there um, and um, open up for questions. Thank you, Joan. I think you answered a couple of questions that that Sylvia and Susana put on the chat. But there is a, a couple of questions that Christine asked. Um, I'm going to read them out loud. But Christine, if you want to open your mic, it's fine as well. Yeah, sure. DNO. Um, do mm -hmm. um, yeah, for DNO insurance, like how often and when do you bring that into the conversation? I mean, we request that. I know it. I know it's really hard, but you know, 
And it depends on, you know, if, if, if the company's raising $500,000, yes, I agree with you, right? There's kind of like, they're not going to spend $50,000 on DNO, right? DNO insurance can be expensive. But, but I would think that, you know, again, if the company's racing, you know, a couple of million or even more, I would strongly rec recommend that, that the company have it. it. It's just good governance. Yeah. Okay. And, there, and there's, I mean, again, it, it's, it's not as difficult as you think. Uh, and, and there's international, um, you know, Chubb and a, a bunch of insurance companies that do cover that. And even at the fund level, I don't know about you guys, but we, we pay for DNO insurance as well. We do, yes. Yeah. And it's a requirement many times as an investor. We, yeah. We're, we're not as bad as the IFC, right? So like the IFC will not take a board seat if the DNO is not, is not there, right? You know, like I've, I've been in boards and they were like, can you please put a DNO insurance? But, but yeah, so some, some, some do require it. Bibi, you have a question as well, right? Yes, hello, thank you very much. Joanna, tell me, what do you recommend the best way to compensate independent board members? Because I sometimes uh, have people that charge us, uh, uh, just a uh, fixed amount. And I don't know if that's the best way to bring them engaged on the, on the team and on the interests of the company. Yeah, no, that's a super good question. Uh, and again, it depends on the independent. And then a good independent needs to be engaged. So if there, he's adding value, one, you're not going to care so much that you're paying him, right? There's always kind of a per board fee, but that per board fee should not be, I see you every quarter for two hours. Like what you're expecting them is that you're also going to call them, right? They're also going to make introductions. Again, sometimes you're bringing board members because they can help on certain things, right? Whether it's intros, whether it's relationships with, with certain you know, government entities, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there should be expectations for the independent. The best way I've seen is, you know, independence, there could be some sharing, even if it's small, of the of the of the carry, right? Of the ESOP. Um, and so, you know, in some boards where we have independent, effective independence, they do have some, some stock options. Um, even if it's small, I think it's just when you think about alignment, it's a, it, it's a good way of aligning that. And, and, and independent, it's hard, right? Because the, the team has to be very comfortable. You also have an opinion as an investor, right? But at the end of the day, that independent needs to be very aware of what his role is. So if it, he's like a good friend of the team, you know, and is, you know, he's not there to protect the team, right? An independent is there to represent all the stakeholders. And again, it just, he needs to really own that independence, which is why, why he's there. So if there's an independent and he's uh, not truly independent, then it didn't really, you know, help. Great, Patricia, Patricia Sainz had another question. Patricia, do you want to open up your mic? Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to know, what do you think about committees? You know, when, when do you start to do like the committees and if you think it's a good practice or it brings like more work for the entrepreneurs? So what's your thought about that? Yeah, so, and I, I, again, I mentioned this, I think at the beginning, it's really hard to establish committees. Again, if you're gonna establish committees, I would say do comp. And sometimes, I mean, it's not even a committee, it's just you establish like, a, if it's three and it's gonna be the CEO and the two, two investors, in any case, have a session on compensation, right? And have sessions on compensation. So for me, a comp committee is very important. And again, an audit committee is very important, but committees really become very effective once the board is, 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 is larger, right? Because once the board is larger and, and there's gonna be kind of, you know, certain discussions, that, that's when you try to kind of build, build groups um, and, and just make sure that you have 
smaller working groups are going to be effective because again if you have seven to eight people it, it becomes very difficult so committees become more relevant as the board is is larger um having said that again there may be important you can take sessions right and 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 think about again we're going to talk you know in this session let's think about strategy in this session let's think about compensation and just you know make sure that those happen Great, we have another uh, question from Rebecca. Hi, Joanna, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, you, you know, you mentioned how sometimes you get the information kind of last minute and uh, there are political dynamics happening in the board often. And I think, you know, a lot of CEOs, especially from early stage companies think, I, you know, my goal is to get the check checklist, the signatures, get the board off my back. And intentionally they share information that is minimal and last minute, right? Instead of thinking, how can I actually get value from this board? So uh, do you have any recommendations on, or suggestions on how to create the right interaction patterns, the right mood so that everybody starts with a collaborative mindset? I mean, we actually, and again, we're the type of investors that really push corporate governance early on. And so we, me and my team spend a lot of time prepping the company and helping them um, just to get ready for boards. So we share kind of, okay, here's, here's an example of an effective board presentation, right? Um, we, we, we actually spend time with them before the board meeting on KPIs and some financials so that we understand them right and 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 have them present the, the the key ones right because again if you're kind of presenting too, too much information it gets lost so my you know and and then again everyone will what i found in board is that everyone starts saying can you please send this can you please send this sooner right and and, and you start getting that dynamic where the team has has to put it together um of course, if you don't, if, if it's kind of a startup and they don't have a finance team, it does become difficult, right? So make sure that at least on the agenda, the main points you want to discuss are there, uh, because an agenda can be shared, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with a lot of time. So at least you know, make sure that the agenda is there. But we spend a lot of time coaching uh, our entrepreneurs just early on. And definitely the materials get, get better with time. Um, you know, Lina's there, so but she can definitely share some of some of our experience there because she, she works a lot with our entrepreneurs and just getting that. Thank you, Joanna. And I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Camila, you want to open up your mic? Yes, yes. Hi, how, I, how are you, everyone? Thank you, Shona, for your presentation. It was super interesting. I have to do a disclaimer. I haven't participated uh, if, uh, as a director in a board. I have stepped um, as, a, as an observer, uh, but just like temporarily. Um, so I, I guess my, and this might be a dumb question. <laughs> I guess my, my main um, concern or, or at least curious is how do you bring those uh, insights and interesting conversation that might have happened at the board level to the rest of your team to continue help on that company from a portfolio management perspective. Uh, is there a way to do that? Um, uh, I mean, as, as you have a, an agenda to prepare for the board, then the companies might have like a, a, a follow-up document on, on whatever it has been discussed or, I mean, yeah. I'm, yeah, now that's super interesting. So if we get the board materials on times, usually I'm, I'm before the board meeting, I'm sitting with my team and we're we're discussing it. Um, so we're actually looking at the material. We're having like an hour conversation of the board material and what are some of the key questions or points that we want to highlight or concerns that we may have. Right. So there, there's prep work before the board, and then after the board. Uh, and Lina, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the spot here, but we usually do follow up and send an email to our investment committee on the main things. It's not always super timely. <laughs> Sometimes we gather a lot of, you know, 
uh, month of information, but what we try to say, okay, the, there's a board, here's a presentation, here are some of, some of the points. And from there, for every company, we have action points uh, that, that it becomes almost a checklist for us. And we have two huddles every, every week and we're checking on those things with the company. So part of the board conversations become part of our checklist that we look at twice during the week. Um, that, that's it. Any, any thoughts there? I think I will also add, you know, like we typically have like very like ongoing conversations with other board members. For example, we do have WhatsApp groups for every company. So like if we see like any news like that is interesting for the sector or the company, you know, like we just share them in WhatsApp or like we just highlight points that then we discuss at the board members at the board. Uh, so it's like it's a very it's like an ongoing like conversation every time. So we do look at the KPIs. But we're also discussing, you know, like relevant things that are happening in the market, like on a timely basis. So it's like we do spend like the prep work is more on the KPIs, making sure like the business wise is good. But also we do spend a lot of time of like looking at like new structures, uh, like new strategies, like new companies that could, you know, like be competition or not. So so it's um it's like also working on the strategy. Like we we don't tend to focus a lot on the KPIs. We check them, but it's not our main function for the board yeah and, and then what i would say is that there's there's a whatsapp where the, the whole team it's the team and the board and then there's a whatsapp of the other board members without the the, the ceo right because there's some conversations that so again this is this is human dynamics people it's it, it is truly the boards are, are mostly about human dynamics so that's again i want to stress that um there's which one is the one? Do you have insights about the dynamics of how to make better decisions on the board if boards are failing? Hmm. Um, God, it, I mean, at the end of the day, again, it's do you have the right information? Do you have the right people? Um, do you have trust? And sometimes it is about just being very open on, 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 on some discussions. Um, but if, if, if the board becomes very toxic, I think at the end of the day, it does end up being a lot of, like I've been in situations where the CEO pings me outside and says, can you help me with this, right? And so rather than bringing it as a board dynamic, it ends up where I'm doing different calls to try to bring, bring alignment. Um, because if they're together in a board meeting, they start screaming. So it's uh, so, so some of it can be done during the meeting. Some of it is work outside of the meeting. Since we have to keep closing, but there are two, I believe, short questions. One was from Valeria. What's your experience or your position on board members that are as well shareholders? Well, that, that's been, my, my experience has always, except when I built, for example, the nonprofit board and, and, and whether I'm an advisory board is usually I represent a shareholder. So that's really tough because as a board, you're making decisions at the company, but you're also representing shareholders. So you've got to kind of wear both both hats. And, and, and I mean, I think it's just a reality of boards, right? There's a lot of, of representation of shareholders and, 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 and you're looking for the, for, for the, for the rights of shareholders, the, the one thing I would say there is the way we view it, at it is that if there's alignment, at the end of the day, what you're doing right for the company should also be the best interest for you as a shareholder. If you really are adding and it's the right decision for the company, then you should benefit as a shareholder, right? Where I feel tension is in some conversations where the CEO is not aligned and there's some you know, personal gain there, right? When, when, when it becomes off market, where, where you know, the, the, the yeah, discussions become more around cap table and ownership, that, that becomes a little messy. But, but in general, I would say, you know, as you represent the company and shareholders, there should be total alignment there. The last one is how many boards it would be it would be reasonable for one person to manage in time. I mean, and it depends again if you have support from a team. But in at, at least in Alabar, we say about five to six is about 
the max that you can manage effectively. Yeah. That's my experience. Johanna, um, we are so lucky to have you and for you to have accommodated your very tight schedule to, to share all your experiences is a pleasure. Listening to you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all come out of this webinar enriched with your wisdom of the years that uh, is invaluable. And as you said, one can read a lot of websites, but hearing from those who have gone through the process, who have been there 10, 15 years ago, and now with the outlook that gives you all those years of experience is really um, a huge value add for this community. And uh, on behalf of everybody, especially of Marta, who hasn't been able to be with us for a family personal um, death in the family, um, I, I thank you a lot and I encourage everybody to think very much about some, some of the huge relevant tips that Johanna had uh, given us. For me, I take away among all your pairs of wisdom, this idea of you really have to uh, have a high functioning board. So you have to work and the relationships in the board so you really help the company. And you also have to create that circle of trust. So thank you a lot for those sorts of making time on a Friday. And I'm sure, you know, we'll be soon together in another webinar. No, and again, if there's any question, anything, you know, we're, we're all in the same group. So, you know, always, always happy to help. And again, as I said, you know, if anyone has other thoughts, I'm always learning. So also look forward to, to hearing that. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Gracias. 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 Gracias.